Ron Carrico, it's August the 5th, 2019, and today we're talking to Ed Davidson here at the San Diego Air and Space Museum in San Diego, California. Uh, Ed was a B-17 pilot in World War II, and after that he became an airline pilot with American Airlines. So let's just start from here. So where were you born? I was born in a small town in upstate New York in the Catskill region, Bovina Center, New York. And when was that? July 31st, 1923. Well, you just had a birthday. Yes, so 96. Not, oh, you're a young man then. <laughs> what did your parents do for a living? Uh, my dad was a Marine in World War I, landed in France in December of 17, walked all the way across France, and after the armistice was signed, kept going east, served in the Army of Occupation in Germany, and came home and June of 1919, and got married to my mother. Had so, uh, did your dad ever talk very much about World War I? Enough to know that I didn't want to be in the trenches. I wanted to be in the air. <laughs> so, now 19, so you were born, when the war started in 1940, in Europe that is, where were you then? I graduated from high school in June of 1941 and started school at Aviation Mechanics Ground School in Elmira, New York. And I was th there when Pearl Harbor happened and a whole bunch of us were going to go to Canada because Ca Canada was taking 18-year-olds with high school education. Right. And U.S. Air Force, or Army Air Corps at the time, required two years of college and age 20 to get into the cadet program. Right. Went home for Christmas and Dad says, don't be too hasty, wait a little bit. So in February or March, our government reduced the requirements to 18 with a high school education. So by April 4th, I was down to New York City to enlist in the Army Air Corps. Wow, so April 4th of 42. 4th of 42, yes. 42. Okay, so, uh, and you wanted to be a pilot, so was, how did, did you tell them or did they tell you or how did that work out? Well, I made sure I was at the Army Air Corps recruiting station. Oh, I see. I see. Which indicates, and uh, the immediate test that they gave there, my scores were high enough that I was accepted into the cadet program. So you had the eyesight and the other things that went yeah. along with it and the mental ability and all that to yes. be a pilot. Not saying that takes too high a mental ability, but <laughs> I, I understand at one point they actually uh, they wanted navigators to be you know, for the higher scores because, well, let's face it, it's easier to steer than it is to <laughs> figure out where you're going sometimes. Yeah. I hadn't heard that. <laughs> well, being pilot, I was a pilot too, so being pilots, we always think we're the <laughs> the cream of the crop, as it were. So. What are, where did you, so you enlisted April, and now what happened then? Did you go in right away? Or? No, I was sent home to wait my orders, and finally the orders came June of 1942 to report to Maxwell Field, Alabama. Really? Okay. Which we, is where we did our pre-flight training. And pre-flight, now, I've never, that, that term pre-flight, what did that mean exactly? Before flight. <laughs> Before the flight training. Okay. How, how to wear a uniform, how, how to eat a square meal, oh. how to be a, a military person. But when you graduated, did they make you an officer then? Or no, what? no, no. The, the, we weren't commissioned until we finished our flight training. So where'd you go to flight training then? Well, could we go back to Maxwell Field for sure, just a please. moment? Yeah. Because it was there that I met Jim Bellingham from Rochester, New York. I don't believe it. And Fred Kenny from Bell Vernon, Pennsylvania, and myself were in class 43C, which meant that if everything went according to plan, that we would graduate, get our silver wings, and our commissions in March of 1943. Hmm. So what were the, so those two that you met, why is that significant? Because the three of us ended up being shot down on our seventh mission. All three of us ended up at Stalag Luft 
three, uh, excuse me, Stalaglyph one in Barth, Germany. All three of us in the south compound. So you guys are in the, the same barracks. You're all in the same airplane. No, just got shot down at the same Fred, day. No, Fred was shot down in October of '43 over Munster. Jim was shot flying out of Africa. Got shot down over Augsburg in December of '43. And I got shot down over Bordeaux, France, in January of 1944. So we were in the same. Fred was in the 95th bomb group. Jim Bellingham was in the second bomb group, and I was with with the 96th bomb group in England. So you were basically uh, reunited, as it were. We were separated, then reunited. Jeez, <laughs> oh, I bet that happened a lot. Come to think of it, the number of airplanes that were shot down. It, it, a lot of times, yes. So what? Did, what? Did, so where did? Okay, now after Maxwell, where did you go? After what? After Maxwell, where did you go? I went to Decatur, Alabama, for the Stearman, the PT-17. Right. And then to Walnut Ridge, Arkansas, for the BT-13. And then to George Field, Illinois, for the AT-9, AT-10. And I was six hours short of having enough time to graduate. I came down with spinal meningitis, and uh, so I had to drop back two classes. Instead of class graduating in 43C, I graduated with 43E in May of 1943. From there, went to B-17 transition at Columbus, Ohio. And I was a pilot on a B-17 before my 20th birthday. So now let's back up. So you, you go to these different stages. You, you start with the steerman, then you go to the, what they call BT-13. Yeah, the... Uh, Vaulty vibrator. Vibrator, right. And then the AT-10. Most of the time in the, uh, in the advanced training, I had more time in the AT-9 than I did in the AT-10. Now what's an AT-9? I don't know that one. It's a Curtis Jeep, I think they call it. Okay. There's a picture of it in the... Uh, brochure that I gave you. Okay, good. Okay, yeah. I'll, I'll find it. Yeah. Um, all right, so now you go to, now, you were tracked into multi-engine airplanes right away, or how did that happen? The needs of the service. I don't know how they determined it or where, when they determined during our training. But. So when you, when you're about to graduate uh, out of the Volte, that must have been the point at which they separated yes. the pilots from one way, yeah. bomber transport pilots from another way. Um, because Fred Kenny went to single engine advanced training, the AT-6, right. ended up as co-pilot on a B-17, where Jim and I went to multi-engine advanced training and ended up on the B-17. So he went to the single seater, but must not have done well enough or something like that, and so he made him a co-pilot. Who knows? Yeah. And the same thing with uh, your crew position, you ended up as a pilot, aircraft commander, first, yeah. what do you want to call it. Uh, but do you know how they make this? Because, I mean, well, let's, let me get to that. So, and you flew the, the G model B-17? E model. The E model, okay. Yeah. Now, it didn't have guns in front then, did it? No. No, oh, okay. So, tell me, tell me about the B-17. What was it like to fly, anyway? Well... With progression from primary to advanced, primary to basic to advanced, we're gradually going to a more complex airplane, bigger right. airplane, right. and so forth. So it was just a, a bigger one, uh, one of the largest at the time, but uh, it was easy to fly, very stable, good performance. And the airspeed and altitude you flew at? Our bombing missions were probably 24 to 26,000 feet. Generally couldn't go higher with a full fuel load and, and bomb load. So you did a cruise climb to get up to higher altitude? Yeah. And now at that time, with it, so when did you actually get to, well let's, let's back up again. At one point you were crewed up with, an air, with a crew, pilot, co-pilot, they have bombardier and all that. Okay. Right. That was after the training at Columbus, Ohio. Right. which was strictly to train the pilots. And then I went home for my birthday and then went to the state of Washington, Spokane and Ephrata, Washington, where we picked up 
our crew was formed there. That's where they put the pilot, the co-pilot, the, the navigator and the bombardier and the, and the rest of the enlisted crew together as a crew. And what was your, your, what was your co-pilot's name? Clarence Truby. And now, how did, how did he end up being a co-pilot and you being a pilot? That I don't know. Like, why, why was Fred Kenny a co-pilot and not a pilot? I don't know. I really don't know. Kennedy? Don't you, mean Joe, you mean Joe Kennedy? The, the who? Ken, well, you said Kennedy, so. Fred Kenny. Fred Kenny, oh, okay. My, my original street group yeah. went through the training. Oh, that's weird. So, now you formed in Washington. Yes. And then, how many missions did you, or how many flights did you go on together as a, as a, uh, as a crew, before you went overseas? Oh, we trained, it would be August and September, early October. We spent in training as a crew in Washington or Ephrata or Spokane. And when that training was completed, we went to Grand Island, Nebraska for a final check. And there the crews were either given an airplane to fly across but my crew was put on a train to New Jersey. They got on the Queen Mary and went across the Atlantic on the Queen Mary. And then we went to the 96th bomb group as a replacement crew. So when you train in the B-17, one of the things you're gonna to have to learn how to do is fly formation. Did you have formation training before that? Yes, it started in uh, actually in our, our primary with the Stearmans. Right. So flying a B-17 in formation is hard, easy? It's, it takes constant attention. Well, I've seen so many, I've seen films of guys flying in front, I'm sure you've seen them too, you've seen the, the wingman looking out the right wing and he's just going up and down and up and down like that. And, <clears throat> Did you fly in these huge, massive, well, you flew in the box structure. Yeah, early box, yes. <clears throat> and that was 18 airplanes, I believe? It's a peculiar number of airplanes. 20, 27, I think. 27, ooh, wow. Yeah, because the lead element was three, number two element was three, the th third element was three, so that's nine. That would be one squadron, then the second squadron, then the third squadron. Later, they put in the fourth. Originally, the, the bomb groups were formed with only three squadrons, and then they uh, increased it to, to a fourth. So when you flew in training, did you ever get into the, a huge gaggle like that? Or were no, they... no. The most, most I think we ever had was maybe a six or nine ship formation. So, and then would you actually, where were the, so you actually dropped bombs in training? In training, yes. And when But that would be a separate mission from the formation flight. Oh, really? Yeah. We've, if, you did a, if you did it separately then, uh, what were you dropping? Uh, sandbags, Sand dummy bomb, okay. 100 pound bombs. Okay. And the navigator was using the North bomb site? No, the bombardier. The bombardier, I'm sorry. Yeah. I always get confused. It seems like one could do the same thing as the other. Well, they finally... Uh, I need to interrupt just for a second. So the bombardier, and when you were doing the practice bombing, the bombardier, I'm sure you were dropping from altitude 20 to 25,000 feet. Yes. So the bombardier would, you put it on autopilot, I believe. Yes. And the bombardier would make fine corrections to get to the target. Right. Any idea how accurate that was at the time? I think it was fairly, fairly accurate. But again, this was a training period for the bombardier. Right. They'd only had the, the static uh, in, the, in the training room with their trainers for dropping bombs before. But this was the actual airplane at altitude. So before that, they had some sort of a moving thing that went underneath them. I, I think it was, a, it was either a moving track or a moving uh, vehicle over a fixed plate. Right, right. Like the drop. So, so when you finally got into these big formations, how wide would the formation be? 
Well, the wingspan's 103 feet. Right. So 300 plus feet for, for an element. Right. And another 300 on each side. So, so like a thousand You're getting about a thousand. About a thousand. So when you, you had these big formations, it was just saturation bombing, actually. Yeah. The lead bombardier would be on the target. And, but all the rest of the airplanes out here, where their bombs are going down parallel to where the lead bomb is. Right, right, right. So. I got to back up for a minute. Yeah. Okay, so you took the Queen Mary over. Yes. Were you guys all, was the crew all together or was it separated officers and enlisted? Separated. So there were three officers on board, right? Four. Four. Bombardier, nav. Pilot, co pilot, bombardier, navigator. So, how long did it take? Ten days or so? Four and a half days. Four and a half days. We so went across fairly rapidly. Escort ships with you? No. Yeah. We outran all this, the, any support. No. Oh. Good way to do it. So, what was the mood like? You're all young guys, right? Anxious to go to war? Yeah. Hope the war's not over before we get there. Really? Yeah. No kidding. That chance of that, huh? <laughs> you know, do you actually expect to get 25 missions? We hope to, yes. I think they. I think I read they lost. They had like they made 12,700 B-17s. They lost our, over half of them. And then reading this guy's log, it was there were airplanes falling out of the sky all over the place. Well, <clears throat> some people are more eloquent with their words and some say only the facts so uh, there's always embellishment it seems on a lot of these well, stories. Well it's when you read it you'll see it's it seems it's pretty sh everything's pretty short yeah you know six shoots two shoots no shoots you know it's off the ground spinning out you know mm. guys running into each other in formation yeah you know it's just <laughs> scary stuff so you guys are all excited to get in there. Oh yeah. Probably having a party half the time. And no, not really. No, no adult refreshments on no. the way? <laughs> well, 20 years they've aged, you know. In the States, you're not legal to, to, to drink. But when you got to Germany or to England, it wasn't that way. No, but I only remember being off base one time in the six weeks I was in England. And I think that was New Year's Eve. And uh, I don't ever remember going to the officers' club, like all the movies show. Everybody really? in the officers' club and so forth. No kidding. But, so okay. So when did you arrive in England? About the middle of November, '43. And now there was training going on there too. Yes. And what was the training like there? What kind of training did you do? Well, here's where we got the local procedures of the takeoff assembly. We'll talk about that, take off an right. assembly. All right. <clears throat> I like to, to speak in, the, in threes, because the element is three airplanes. We get a wake-up call, go to briefing. Go to, go to the briefing. And what time? What time are the briefings? It depends on the, the generally 4.30, 5 o'clock in the morning. Right. And... Uh, get your determination of your position in the formation. And at engine start time, everybody starts engines. We're all parked around the periphery of the airplane, of the airport. Which airfield? Snetterton Heath, at, England, in England. Netterton Heath? Snetterton Heath. N-E-T-H-E-R-T-O-N? Heath? Yes, Heath, yeah. And... Uh, Heath means woods, doesn't it? It's meadowland or Something like that. Brush land or something. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> and we have a perimeter taxiway all the way around the airport. So we're parked on hard stands around the, the peripheral. And the lead airplane goes by, number two falls in behind him, number three behind him, and so forth, and coming the other side. So that we get to the end of the takeoff runway, we're all lined up. Number one goes into position. Starts his power up, say at 8 o'clock for takeoff time. 8 o'clock, full throttle, goes down the runway. 
Number two moves into position. 20 seconds later, full power and down the run. 30, 20 seconds later, another one goes. So that puts three airplanes a minute in the air. So we're climbing out at 150 miles an hour, 500 feet a minute, to a radio beacon. Because probably we're on instruments. Almost all the time we're on instruments. And sometimes it's nighttime, even. At the beacon, we do a 180 degree turn, still climbing, 150 miles an hour, 500 foot a minute, until we break out on top. So we're in this racetrack. When you break out, number one fires some flares, assembly flares. So number two can pick him up. He goes and joins up. Number three breaks out, and he comes and joins up. When you have that whole group assembled, over here, with the 96th here, over here's a 452nd at Defham Green, they're doing the same thing. And over here's the 388th at Gnetashell, and they're doing the same thing. And they're about six to eight miles apart, these airports. No radar, radio silence. So you've got these three strings of airplanes going up, and they get up on top, then they start forming up. And the beacons that we're going to, they call buncher beacons, which is where they bunch the airplanes together. Get your group or your wing assembled, and then you go to a splasher beacon, which means you're going across the channel or the North Sea. And that's where the formation is finally getting all together to, to go to the target. Wow. At about 10,000 feet, Everybody goes on oxygen with a radio check. And if we're over the water, test fire the guns. So from that point on, we're on oxygen, flying formation for the next six or eight hours. So what was the, what was the biggest group you ever flew in? Probably a wing group, which would be, uh, wing, which would be three groups of 27 each. So, I don't know, multiple, was that 800 <laughs> airplanes or something like that? I don't, I don't even know. I know they had 1,000 bomber raids, I know yeah, that. Yeah, but that came later. Yeah. <clears throat> I think it was happened after March or April of 44. Hmm. So, the, in the, so when you did the practicing though, the, the practicing was sing, single ship or just a three ship type thing? No, or? that's when we when we came up to the whole, getting a whole squadron right. together. Well, they practiced together. Yes. And so that in that case, when you formed up, you were going to go bomb something in over by Ireland or something, right? I mean, no, actually, it was just it, forming the, the uh, squadrons into the group. And then when that was terminated, we come back for peel off and landing. We actually didn't bomb anything on our practice. Okay. Was, so now reading that journal, I was surprised there were briefings constantly. It seemed like there was every day it didn't fly, there was briefings. Oh yeah. And what were the briefings about? F flying tighter formations, more protection. And also briefing on escape procedures sometimes. I mean, if you got shot down, well, let's face a lot of guys are going to get shot down, so. I don't ever remember anything concerning that. We may have had it, but I, I just don't have a recollection of it. Yeah. With the idea of the fact you could be shot down, people carried things with them to help escape, right? I mean, you probably had a 45. Yes. And you probably had, uh, uh, I know they had, they had uh, pictures. Guys would take pictures of themselves in case they ran into the underground some way. They could put make up some phony identification. You recall that at all? No, I don't. The fighter pilots did that, I know for sure. And one of the fellows I interviewed, his father's name was Han Scharf, S-C-H-A-R-F-F. -F. And he was the master interrogator for the fighter pilots, the American fighter pilots. And the guys carried with them 
pictures in civilian clothes. And of course, the Germans are always trying to find out things about them, uh, the guys, uh, you know, where they were from and so forth and so on. And of course, they had a big file. Uh, everybody got shot down just about. And one of the things they would do is they could, the guys would have these pictures and they could identify where the guy was from because of the suit he was wearing and the tie. You see this tie next to, well, that's the 355th squadron. That's how they, you know. But it was, I, I, didn't, know if they, I didn't know if they did that thing with the uh, bomber crews or not. They did. Uh, when, uh, <clears throat> when we were shot down, we went to Dulag Luft first, for, which is where the, we were interrogated. And what city was that, do you remember? Um, Near Frankfurt. 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 Frankfurt, okay. And uh, we had about a week in solitary confinement. <clears throat> I never did see my crew there, but every day we'd have an interrogation with this master interrogator. And uh, after the third or fourth day, he said, I can't waste any more time with you. And I didn't know what that meant. So he pulls my dossier out of his file, tells me where I was born, where I went to training. And by the way, did you see any submarines when you came across on the Queen Mary? No kidding. And when I got to the base. How about that? Yeah. So it was not only the fighter pilots, but also the bomber crews. So they did it to you guys too. But they had a lot of German immigrants that had come to the United States. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, when you graduate from a flying school, it's in the local newspaper yeah, and so right. forth. So. Well, he told stories about it, this. Uh, I have a, Han, Han Scharf lives up in, uh, her son, Chris Scharf, lives up in uh, Carlsbad. And he had a video of his dad. His dad came to the States afterwards and testified on behalf of some American fighter pilots. And he said, what I learned from, they couldn't resist my techniques. He was, he was, you were just following other airplanes, so the navigator really didn't have to do much except follow another airplane. No, he pretty much was not concerned with that as to where we were on the map. Right. So that if something happened that we had to turn around and head home, right. he would know a heading to give me to, to get what me did, started home. What were they using for navigators? Was that where the time where they were using the G-Box or whatever it was called? They were just introducing that, yeah. And what did that do anyway? It was like Loran, Loran. Okay. Similar to it. Okay. And chaff? Were they using chaff at the time? We did carry chaff. I remember dispensing that over, I don't know, Bremen or Emden. It's supposed to scatter and to confuse the radar. Who threw it out? The radio operator. From the front of the airplane? Well, from his position. Yeah. In the radio room. So who made the decision about when and did everybody drop at the same time or? I don't know. I don't know whether that was it or whether that was part of the uh, standard briefing that we would dispense chat because of the known anti-aircraft batteries that were So there. on those other six missions, were you over the top of the clouds where you couldn't see the ground below you or? Sometimes, yeah. And I guess in this type of the war, they weren't too concerned about where they were dropping. No. <clears throat> I remember that I've read a lot of books about this stuff and and um, one of the first ones I read it was about then Colonel Travis as in Travis Air Force Base and how he went there in a B-24 was in the right seat commanded the mission they got down to Schweinfurt I think it was with 360 airplanes and they couldn't see the ground so they did a 360 360 planes to a 360. They did it three times. <clears throat> no wonder they lost 60 airplanes. <laughs> they probably lost 50 of them mid airs, you know? Yeah. <clears throat> did you ever get, was any of the flak ever effective against your airplane? Did you ever get pick any, any holes? Not, in not disabling, no. We pick up some pieces, but not any direct burst. You know Ralph Kling, right? Yes. And he showed me a, a thing that they had 
where they could send messages through the mail and if it was addressed with like March 3rd 1942 there'd be one way but if it would if it said 3 March 42 then there was a coded message inside did you have anything like that for the bomb? Not that I was aware of, no. Yeah, they had, there was a matrix that you could use, and then you could pick out, you know, words, and then mm -hmm. it would, you know, make some <clears throat> sense. Yes, in the war, and then of course, don't know him. and then Ralph was shot down in what September '44, I think. Yeah, I think so. But again, he went to Loop Three, and you went to Loop One, apparently. So. So anyway, now. It just. Thinking about what a ma what these massive formations must have been like to fly in, it must have been pretty scary. To... Well, basically, you were flying your position and your leader. Right. And you just hoped that everybody else would stay where they're supposed to be, not come into your space. Because there's not much room to maneuver, except to break away from a formation. So were there breakaway procedures? Yes. Which kind of like... Move to the outside. Okay. Yeah. And so if you got lost in the fog or whatever, you would... Well, fog penetration or cloud penetration was a different formation. You'd turn right for, or left, turn out two or three seconds, right. and back to the heading right. okay. until you get visual again. Right, right. So, okay, now let's talk about recovery. Now you come back, well, let's say it's... A, for some odd reason, the whole formation made it back. How did you recover all that many airplanes? There would be about 75 to 100 airplanes from each base, right? Right. How, so how did, what was the recovery procedure? No, there's pro if we go back to three squadrons, there would be 27 for a squadron, okay. times three. Times three, so 20, uh, okay, 80. It's a so. group. Uh, they need to come over, and then num number two on the lead would peel off. 30 seconds later, the next, next one, 30 seconds later, then you into the pattern and land. So it's basically an overhead pattern. Yeah. On that rare, clear day in England, huh? Yes. But if you came back for weather penetration, how'd you do it? I don't know. I don't, rem don't remember that. <clears throat> but I do remember blue lead-in lights. After you broke, you'd pick up a string of blue lights on the ground and you follow that around oh, no kidding. and it leads you to the end of the runway. Where did you land? Fort Smith? Firth of Clyde is where the Queen Mary docked. Right. And we got on a train and next thing I know we're at, the, at our bomb group. <clears throat> Did you get and we get assigned to a barracks, the officers together, and they're listed in, in their section. And we're taking somebody's bunks that didn't come back that day. That day? Yeah. We were replacement crews. Originally, the 96 trained as a group in the States, and they went overseas as a group. Right. So they were all buddy buddies from all the training they had together. So when did that group arrive there in the first place? I would say early 42, maybe April of 42. And when were the barracks built? Well, it, it depended. We, I think they, the 96 originally went into some base that was already there, a RAF, Royal Air Force sure, base or right. something like that, until another base was built. So the barracks you were in were Reasonably new, a couple of years old. Yes, so. yeah. Quonset Heights. Quonset Heights, right. Yeah. Or Nissan Huts, that's the other way to name it. Yeah. Yeah, same thing. <laughs> so, now, when a crew didn't come back and you would take their place, had somebody already cleaned out their lockers and all that stuff? Oh, yeah. yeah. So. Yes, when a crew doesn't come back, they file a missing air crew report. Right. With all the particulars that they have at the time. Have you ever looked at the missing air crew report? No. <clears throat> they list the engine serial numbers, tail number of the airplane, 
I think they list the gun numbers so that if they find any part like that, they can tie it to that airplane. Well, my missing, this is jumping a little bit ahead, my missing air crew report said that five parachutes came out of the airplane, airplane exploded, no other survivors. In fact, four parachutes came out, my four F gunners bailed out because they couldn't contact me because our communications were shot out. The airplane was on fire. The co-pilot in the seat next to me was killed by a message about 109 fighter attack. And we were out over the Bay of Biscay. And the number three engine was on fire, right wing was on fire, small fire in the cockpit. And uh, my dead co-pilot sitting there. And the navigator came up out of the nose to see what was going on. I told him to come back and tell the gunners to wait till we got over land, we're gonna bail out. He came back to say, they've already left. <laughs> so they presumably drowned because the bodies were never recovered. Oh no. So I ditched in the Bay of Biscay and the airplane floated about 10 minutes I guess and I went out the side window up on top and the, the uh, engineer, the, the turret, top turret gunner and the radio man were getting the two life rafts out and tied them together. So the remaining crew of five got in his two life rafts and then the airplane sank with the co-pilot in it, so. So four chutes went out, co-pilot went down, and so that is, that does add up to 10, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, obviously this is a very vivid memory for you. Yes. <clears throat> and was it a German boat that came up to pick you up or? A German flying boat. Flying boat. Came out and landed beside it. Made a couple of passes over us with a machine guns tracking us like right. that. So right. I took my 45 and dumped it in the bay. How come? I didn't want to give it to the Germans. And I wasn't about to have a running battle with them. It sounds like a very wise decision to me. <laughs> and the flying boat lands and? Taxi's over to us. And we paddled up to it. And here's a big pistol for you, the war is over. Yeah, for that, that that's such a great statement. <laughs> I get, they must have said that to everybody. <laughs> Probably, yeah. <clears throat> so they took us aboard and our lifeboats, I mean our life rafts, and took off and flew back into the Bay of Biscay at the, at the harbor, and we spent that night in the hospital. Hospital? The hospital in Bordeaux. But, I mean, you weren't injured at all. No, but we had a little bit of exposure four hours in the life rafts. Oh. What, what, so what month was this? January of 44. Ooh, boy. Man. What, what was the target? My target was the uh, FW-190 maintenance repair or manufacture of aircraft at the airport at Bordeaux, France, occupied France. Were you going in or coming out? We had hit the target and we're out over the Bay of Biscay turning order toward home when we got shot down. Okay, so you flew, you flew seven, that was your seventh mission. Yes. Uh, what were the first six? Emden, Kiel, Bremen, Munster, Ludwigshaven, Paris. This is again a, a saturation bombing type thing. Yes. Yeah. Now you would think of something in Paris, though. You would think you want to be more specific instead of just bombing a thousand foot wide swath. Yeah. If, as I remember, we had only our group instead of the wing. Okay. Was there that day. So smaller concentration. Smaller group. Yeah. <clears throat> and of course, being in the front, you never could see whether you hit anything or not. No. Did the gunners actually tell you whether you hit anything, or are they too busy? Generally, they're too busy. I don't ever remember a, a bomb assessment report in flight. Really? Did you, were you ever involved with Pathfinders? They were just starting then, but I was uh, not involved with any Pathfinder flights that, I, that were, I was aware of. Your bombardier was bombing off the lead bombardier. 
Yes. And so... Yeah, when hit, the lead bombardier's bomb base come open, everybody's bomb base come open. Right. When the bombs start out of there, everybody's salvos. And all you're doing is flying formation. Yeah. So the lead bombardier was probably on autopilot. Yes. And you were just hand flying the airplane to stay right. in position. So you've made your pass, you've dropped your bombs on Bordeaux, and you're thinking, we made it through the flak. And what was the flak like? It was not too bad on that, on that trip. But the, the ones over Germany, especially up in the Kiel, Bremen area, pretty intense flak because they had the submarine pens up there. And uh, they were pretty well protected with flak guns. And the... Now, what, what is that like? I mean, some people say it's kind of pretty to see it, but... Well, if you see it, it's not going to hurt you, probably. Yeah. It's the one that goes off right underneath you. <clears throat> and it's like hail on an air, airframe, a fuselage, and so forth. So you hear it. Yeah. <clears throat> so, now you're out over the bay, and you're... What, we get attacked by... A swarm of Messerschmitt 109s. From the front? From the front. It's interesting to read about the attack. I've read actually German things about the tactic they, they used. Mm -hmm. And, you know, after the fall of 44, they were, I, I guess General Doolittle went to a fighter base and there was a sign on the wall that said the duty of the fighters is to protect the bombers. And he said, take that down. The duty of the fighters is to kill the Luftwaffe, mm -hmm. and after that, they just went after them right down to the ground. Yeah, and that 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 pretty much finished <clears throat> their, their air, aerial defense. I had escort of uh, Spitfires, P-38s, and P-40 or P-47s. P-47s, but not enough apparently. And the 50 ones were just starting to arrive in theater, so right. I never saw one over there. <clears throat> the escorts uh, operate. Oh, let's, okay, so in this particular mission, how many airplanes were there in that? How many bombers were there in that? I think it was just the 96 that went to the target in Bordeaux. And, and which flight were you in the, in the element? As I remember it, we were kind of like Tail End Charlie on the right side. So that would have been... Nine. So were you, were you the lead or... The, no, one, no. You, you were, So you were a new guy, so you, oh, were, yeah. you would have been the tail end tail end, yeah. Charlie, probably. Yeah. So did you see the fires coming? Oh, yes. And where was your... Did you, were there P-38s and P-47s nearby that you could see them? Not on the day I got shot down, no. Really? We had uh, the uh, Spitfires that day. They took us to the Brest Peninsula, and that's about as far as they could go. So right. They left us, and we were unmolested until we got down to the target. Then there was a flak over the target. After the target out over the bay, we got jumped by the Messerschmitt 109s. How many? A swarm. <laughs> I don't know how many. Yeah. And so you saw the one coming at you? That yes. You can see the flashes of the guns, I yes. suppose? <clears throat> What was the conversation like in the cockpit? Can you remember? Uh, we've been calling off position of, of fighters as you saw them. Right. And then, of course, the co pilot got killed, and there was no more conversation. So, And our communications intercom was shot out also, so I couldn't communicate with the rest of the, rest of the crew. Which is why the guys in the back jumped out. And you really can't blame them. If, Burn an airplane, turning like this to go to, toward the closest land. Where did they? Now, where was the flight engineer relative to the pilots? He's in the top turret, right behind the pilots. Did he do anything relative to the engines at all? In other words, when you were flying the airplane, did you set the mixture and the RPM and all that, or did the engineer do it? Not when you're under attack. No, he's up there in his guns. Right, but on he monitors during. Normal flight, takeoffs. But on takeoff, you roll onto the runway, you push the throttles up, and who sets the RPM? You, you walk them up. Okay. Well, to, to steer it. That's a B-17 throttle position. Right, right. 
How long was it? How long was the takeoff roll, generally speaking? With a full load, almost all of the runway. Wow! And what? What was the bomb capacity? Well, it depends on where you're going. Uh, <clears throat> you had to have enough fuel to get there and back. Right. Which sometimes cut down on your bomb load. And there were different kinds of bombs. Yes. 1,000 pound, 500 pound, 200 pound, 100 pound incendiaries. And the incendiaries were smaller bombs? Yes. Did you, which ones did you drop, or do you recall? Generally, it was in the 500 pound range, as I remember. <clears throat> You know, the guy talked about, in the, that journal, talked about dropping incendiaries. And I never really thought about how bad that must have been on the ground. Oh, man. Well, war is hell. The Mr. Smith comes in, did he go up or down under you, or do you recall? Don't recall. I think down, because generally they'd come in, firing and roll, yeah. and split us out. And so he's probably <clears throat> doing, you're probably doing 200, and he's probably doing... Well, we're probably doing 160. 170. And he's probably doing twice that. Yeah. So good closure rate, 400 yeah. knots or so. So right away you recognize the co-pilot was deceased. Yeah. And he was a friend of yours. I heard him, I guess you've been together. Well, before. I'd known him all of six months. Yeah. Uh, so now the engine was on fire, probably from his gunfire. Yes. And we've only lost one engine. That's not too bad, is it? Well, <clears throat> not only was the number three engine burning, but it burned itself off the wing. Ooh. And the number four quit turning, we're going on down to two. And all on one side. Yeah. <clears throat> Would it even fly that way? For a while, yes, depending on your altitude. How high were you? I don't recall, probably over 20,000, but. I thought we were going to get over land, but we didn't make land, so. How far were you from the coast of France? I would say about 12 miles. And which put you 60, 70 miles from the English coast, I guess, down yeah. about, yeah. <clears throat> so now you figured out you have to, you're going to have to ditch. Had you actually studied ditching procedures beforehand? Oh, that was part of the training. Right. We never got to do it. It's like parachuting. We didn't get a chance to practice parachuting either. But. Yeah, well. Who went on? <laughs> so, but when you ditch, so what's the procedure to ditch? It depends on the swells. Right. You try to land parallel and on top of a swell. Right. Because the ball tour is going to dig in first. And uh, you want your wings level, slow speed as possible. Now, was the ball turret, he had gotten out of that position by then. In fact, he was gone, right? He was gone. How did you know they were all gone? They'd all left. Because the navigator came up from the nose to see what was going on. And I told him to go back and tell the gunners to wait till we got over land and we'd bail out. Right. And when he got back there, the radio operator was still there. And the four gunners in the back had already bailed out. So the radio operator was probably, he was probably yelling mayday into the radio or yeah. teletype and giving a position if he could. Yeah. <clears throat> Wasn't there any air sea rescue attempt by the U.S. Air, Air, Air Corps? No, we were five or six hours flying from England. Bordeaux was way down here, next to Spain. Oh, right, right, right. Air sea rescue worked mostly in the Channel or the North Sea. And not that great, as I understand. I mean, I think the Germans had a better. <clears throat> Well, they did save a lot of people, though. Yeah, yeah. So, you slow the airplane down to, what, 80, 90 knots or something like that? Uh, miles per hour. Miles per hour. Yeah. Oh, that's the, right. The old days. Yeah. Well, when did they switch from miles per hour to knots? In the f early 50s? Really? I think. I wonder why. Don't know, whether to make it more common. By the way, did you fly the same airplane all the time? No. 
be uh, whatever number we were given. Uh, that's the, the one we had that day. Some crews got, especially if they flew over, they would keep their own airplane. But a lot of times they wouldn't either. They'd get oh, really? assigned some other airplane. Do you remember the name was, did your airplane have nose art on it? Yeah, Little Girls. Little what? Little Girls. It was already named. Yeah. So uh, that was, one other airplane we flew was Quit Your Bitchin. Quit Your Bitchin, K K W E R B I T C H E M or something. Did, like that. did you ever find pictures of the nose art of that airplane? Yes. You did. Right? Uh, that's a picture of my actual airplane in flight. Well, this looks like it has a turret down below in front. Yes. I thought the G model had a was the only one with that. Well, <clears throat> that's what most people think. The last forty or fifty airplanes off the Douglas line. F line had chin turrets. They were F models with chin turrets. Ah, okay. So now this airplane here, who would, so who would, that was a bombardier would take that then? The bombardier would run the lower turret then? Yes, the nose turret. Well, you can see why they call them a flying fortress with all the guns sticking out of that thing, can you? 13, 50 calibers. 13, wow. It's really too bad about the uh, the guys in back feeling they're going to be safe just jumping yeah. out. Did they have did they have individual life rafts in their in their seat pack? Or? No, they had life vests. Oh. It was all May West. <clears throat> and that far south in the winter. Yeah. Then did they have? Well, they had they had those. Uh, they were wearing their uh, sheepskin. Sheepskins. Yeah. Which probably just helped them sink. That would pick up a lot of water, and you was pretty pretty soon you'd sink just from that water. I would think. <clears throat> Whether any of them were injured or not, I have no idea. <clears throat> so now, so the guys that made it out were you, your nav, your engineer, and your radio operator, and the bombardier, and the bombardier. So. Did you, did you ever see those guys again after the war? <clears throat> yeah, the uh, radio operator lived out in Santee. Oh, is that right? And uh, in that pamphlet I gave you, got a follow-up afterwards. I made, I made email contact with his two daughters and his son. And uh, in email contact with the navigator's daughter. But I'm the only one that's surviving now of the, yeah. of the whole crew. Yeah. There were, I interviewed a B-24 pilot named Rod Braswell. You might have, I don't know if you knew him or not. He lived up in uh, Vista. He just passed uh, a couple months ago. He never saw his crew again. He flew 30 missions and went to the winds. Yeah. Never saw him again. <clears throat> I just thought that was very strange. So, you hit the water. What was that like? I've never talked to anybody who ditched an airplane before. What was that like, anyway? <clears throat> well, I had uh, unfastened my seatbelt to get out of my flak vest because I didn't want that in the water. Right. So I was here trying to hold the airplane level. Right. And I couldn't fasten my seatbelt again. Oh, no. So I came out of my seat a little bit and sat down again. So it was a good landing. One of your better ones over the years. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> so, the German officer or enlisted guy with his Luger or whatever, for you the war is over. And they take you to a hospital. Yeah. And then? <clears throat> Red Cross came in that night. Oh, really? And uh, we gave him the, uh, the information. And I found out after the war that the Red Cross had broadcast this information to ham operators and somebody in Canada, ham operator in Canada, picked up the information and contacted my parents by telegram wow. that I had been shot down and captured in a prisoner of war. But I was, got to prison camp in January, middle of January, 44, 
And the first mail I received was in June. So from January to June, I didn't know that they knew. Oh, wow. Huh. Did you ever get mail from your parents after that? Eventually, yes. <clears throat> and they got, you know, they got Red Cross packages. Yes, until the last four months of the war. So when you got the Red Cross, what was in those Red Cross packages? I don't remember exactly. A uh, pack of cigarettes. What kind? Um, Lucky Strike, Old Gold, uh, Camels. Did you smoke? Yes. <clears throat> when did you quit? 1955, the day I started with American Airlines. I used to quit every morning. I, it's so, so funny, All the, most of the guys I've talked to your age either hardly ever smoke at all or never smoke. Uh, you know, most people kept smoking. They just, you know, they're all gone now. You know, yeah. <laughs> just like old goals. I suppose old goals are gone by now. So you were so okay. January, they take you to Stalag Loop One, which was where? No, we went to Dulag first at Frankfurt for interrogation. Okay. And then we went through Berlin to Barth. Then what, did, what kind of questions did the officers actually ask? I mean, you know, they, they had all this general information, but what were they asking? Uh, what's your target? Uh, what's your commander's name? Uh, where were you trained? Why did you do this? What did you tell them on why? It's war. Generally, we had been briefed, you have only name, rank, and serial number. Right. Which worked there because I was fortunate in that I was a prisoner of war of the German Luftwaffe. And there was that camaraderie between airmen. So we were never mistreated. We were intimidated, but we're not mistreated, maltreated. Uh, we got cold, we got hungry, but. Uh, it's interesting you said Luftwaffe. You know, most people say Luftwaffe. And uh, Bud Anderson uh, said the same thing. He kept saying Luftwaffe, and I, you know, it didn't leave the E off the end. <laughs> I thought that was interesting. I had called him up and asked him about the interview. I said, is there, is there anything you've never spoken about that you'd like to talk about? And he said, yeah, I'd like to talk about how we beat the Luftwaffe. And then we interviewed, That's he started right there about, yeah. you know, that month or so that they just went after him. Yeah. He said there had been a ceiling of 18,000 feet. Before that, they couldn't go below 18,000 feet. They could chase them Stay away. Stay with the bombers. Stay with the bombers. <clears throat> but I wonder, but they must have had so many air crew coming in like every night. It must have been a factory almost. Yes. With hundreds, <clears throat> perhaps. I remember when they had one mission in Swinefort when they lost 60 aircraft, potentially 600 guys. Yeah. <clears throat> But they did separate the officers from the enlisted. Right. The enlist, my enlisted went to uh, Krems, Austria. And uh, my bombardier, my navigator, myself, went to Stalag Group 1. Where was that? In North Germany, on the Baltic coast, north of, north of Berlin. How'd you get there? By train from Frankfurt. So you were on the, you must have been on that long march in February of forty five when they marched everybody out. Again, I was lucky. We were under Luftwaffe control. I, I met a Brit who was shot down in nineteen thirty nine, oh. and he said he got coned by the searchlights, which means that like this. Sure. And, and then they tell the aircraft gunners where to shoot. Right. <clears throat> so he said we were cloned, got shot down. He went to Stalag Group 1 at Barth, Germany. They closed that and moved him down to Stalag Group 3 right. at Sagan. And then they opened Stalag Group 1 again for British and Allied air crew right. officers. So he went back to Stalag 1. And then they moved him to a camp up in Lithuania. 
the Russians were coming west. Right. And they put all the airmen on the road and marched them to Poland. And they encamped in Poland. The Russians were still coming. So they took them from there and marched them south of Berlin, south of uh, Barth, to the southwest. That was a long march. So Moose, it was called Mooseburg, I think. No, this, this is way north of Mooseburg. This okay. is right up on, along the Baltic coast. Okay. Down to uh, Falling Basel. Now the British and the Americans were coming from the west. So they put them on the roads and toward them back toward Lubeck on the Baltic coast until the English finally caught up with them and liberated those prisoners of war. The POWs in Stalag III were the ones that went down to Mooseburg. Right. And they had that long winter march. We sat there, well, the Russians got to our camp May 1st, or April 30th. April 30th, all the Germans left to go to the British lines about 40 kilometers west. And the Russians got there the next day, liberated the camp. So you were re liberated by the Russians? Yes. And they wanted to take us down to uh, some place down the, in the Baltics, or in the Balkans, to send us home. And our camp commander, Colonel Zemke, said, we're going, not going to do that, we're going to stay here. So we sat there for 13 days. And they flew a bunch of B-17s in from England, landed at the airstrip about three kilometers from the base for the camp. And we marched from our camp, got on a B-17, flew back to France. They put 30 POWs on each B-17 and flew us back to France to the cigarette camps. Have you heard of those? Mm -hmm. And that's where I met my uh, my navigator, not my navigator, my uh, radio operator and top turret gunner again. So I knew they survived. So from Camp Lucky Strike, I hadn't seen London, so I decided before I go home, I caught a ride over to London, spent about a week there, then went to Liverpool and got on the boat back to the United States. Kling was at Salag 3 yeah. and Moosburg. Right, yeah. <clears throat> And did he tell you what happened with him? He went to Paris. Yeah. And then he said they gave him, uh, went to the Grand Hotel, and they gave him $80 and a new uniform. Yeah. And a ticket, and they went down to, uh, they went out drinking. They missed the train the next day, and they kept missing the train for about a week, and <laughs> just had a big time, you know. So, the supplies you got, I mean, the, the things you got from the Red Cross, were that enough to... Uh, sustain. Sustain us? Yeah. And... <clears throat> we did get a ration from the Germans. Uh, it was not always the same. A lot of soup, turnips, rutabaggers. Right. Once in a while, some ground meat of some sort. Of some sort. <laughs> and... Uh, Black German bread. Which is pretty good, actually. Except I think most of it was sawdust instead of flour. Oh, wow. <clears throat> well, they weren't doing too well either. No. So, so you didn't actually... You, you went home pretty much right away then, didn't you? After going to... you went. I mean, you left La Harve, I guess, went to England. So you didn't hang around. You went with the occupation force or anything like that. You didn't get to see what it was like. No, I just wanted to see London, Piccadilly Square. Yeah. And then they got on a boat and went home. <clears throat> I've got to back up a little minute. Yeah. <clears throat> so while you were in any of the camps, was there any discussion about trying to escape at all? Always. Always? Yeah. And what would it be, how would that, who would lead that sort of thing? Well, it was pretty much the same as, uh, we did have British officers there who had been in camp longer than any Americans. And uh, they were generally the ones who pushed the escape tunnels and escape plans and so forth. Well, so they had some tunnels at your place too? Yes. Oh, really? But the problem was that we were on the Baltic coast and we couldn't go down deep because of the water table. Oh, no. Oh. And sandy, loamy yeah. soil. So we didn't have any successful tunnels. 
it, it kept us occupied, though. Something to do. Oh, really? Did you ever get involved in the digging of the tunnels at all? Oh, yeah, a little bit. What did you do? I was in there on, the, on the, my belly, scooping the sand up, passing it back. Oh, really? Oh. Kind of like moles in there. Yeah, yeah. What were the guys they called it? Penguins. Those are the guys that dumped the... Dumped it, yeah. yeah. Had their pant legs full of sand yeah. well, around the parade ground. Did you ever do that? <laughs> no. <laughs> did anybody suspect, Did anybody ever escape? Not to my knowledge. But where would you go? If you could get to, a, to the harbor, you might be able to stow away on a boat, but you didn't know which way the boat was going to go, yeah. whether it was Swedish or whether it was German or so. Yeah, that, that guy that was, uh, I was talking about the, you know, in, the, in the journal, he got, when he got shot down, um, it was about the 23rd mission, he, he was pretty close. <laughs> and. He escaped and evaded, hid in a haystack, and then some farmers hit him out, and and they you know dressed him in, in appropriate clothes. He said he even sat down with some Germans and had lunch one time, some German soldiers, and didn't say a word, of course. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, let's uh, let's move on. Okay, so when do you actually separate from the service then? Well, <clears throat> when we came back from prison camp in June of '45. You got 30 day leave at home, then to Atlantic City for Project R um, training. What's that? Recovered people, people that had been prisoners of war. It was a special Project R. Really? And I've uh, heard of that. Went to Sebring, Florida, requalified in the B 17 to go to Japan. Oh. See, when we enlisted, we enlisted for the duration plus six months. Right. So, fortunately, right after I finished my training at Sebring, the war in Japan ended. So then they had a big reduction in force. And I got out, started Cornell in January of 46. And, because uh, I had a little back pay coming. I'll bet. So I bought a new Ford car. But it was uh, six or eight months before the front bumper arrived. <laughs> <clears throat> so at Cordell, finished my first term, um, got a job in the summer as a groundskeeper at Lake Mayapack in upstate New York, trimming the lawns and the hedges and so forth. And there I met this beautiful Spanish-looking woman, met her about the first or second of July, got married on the 31st of July. Oh, wow. Went back to Cornell, studying mechanical engineering, and uh, occasionally going up to Rome, New York, to fly in the reserves. Oh, really? 86, B-25, and so forth. Oh, cool. And uh, then in September of 48, I'd had enough of mechanical engineering. I transferred to Parks College, St. Louis University, and packed my wife and my, our son and the, all our belongings in a car and drove out to Cahokia, Illinois, which is where Parks College was located, and went into air transportation. And uh, just a few miles from Scott Air Force Base in Illinois, mm -hmm. So I joined the reserve there, I remember flying C-46s. And I got enough time to be an IP in a C-46. And the Korea started in 1950, and we thought we were gonna be recalled to active duty, but we weren't. So I graduated from college, and the next day I got my recall orders for active duty. So, reported for active duty at Scott. And uh, <clears throat> had a chance to upgrade to C-119. So I went to Miami Springs for training there. And then got on the Eastern, Cal Eastern Connie 
and flew from the West Coast to Hawaii, to Japan, to Shiamachi in Japan, based there, flying C-119s. Uh, carry supplies into Korea and bring body bags or wounded home back to Japan. And uh, the day the armistice was signed, part of the agreement was they could not increase the force over that level. So about everything that would fly in Japan was sitting on the ground someplace in Korea to build that number up. So the day the armistice was signed, I was sitting at an airport at Kimpo in Korea. And uh, <clears throat> that was over. So I took a boat back home and picked up my family, whom I had left with my family in Bovina Center. We moved to Long Island, waiting to get an airline job. But back, back to 46, when I first got out, I went to all the airlines, but they weren't hiring. So when I came back from Korea, I had my application in with American and Eastern and Braniff and Pan Am. After about a year, I got a note from Eastern. They lowered their height requirement from five foot 10 to five foot nine. And when I come in for an interview, so I get in the car, drive into Manhattan, <clears throat> decided, well, before I go to Eastern, I'll just stop and see what America's done with my application. They couldn't find it. So, but here, fill this up. So I filled out an application. They looked at it. They said, do you have wheels? I said, yes. They said, go out to LaGuardia Field and interview Captain Harry Clark. So I get in my car, go to LaGuardia, find Captain Harry Clark. We talk a little bit. We got a class starting Monday, be there. Wow. If I'd gone with Eastern or Braniff or Pan Am, they all went out of business before my retire retirement age. Right, right. Yeah. So American was a good choice. Yeah, it was, yeah. When did you retire from the airlines? When? Yeah. On my 60th birthday. Which would be? 1983. 83, yeah, 83, right. So what did you fly in the airlines? Started with Convair 240, DC-4, DC-6, DC-7, Lockheed Electra, 707 as co-pilot. Upgraded on the Electra, then went to Bach 111, 727, 707, 747. 747? Yeah. Oh, you Retired flew. on the 74. Oh, you're so, you flew all of them then. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> and I looked around for other flying jobs, but they were in our deep Af Africa or China or someplace else. And I was married and so forth. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But Americans said, well, why don't you come down and work at our flight academy in Dallas, Fort Worth? Some letters. So in November of 83, I started as an instructor on a DC-10. <clears throat> And in February, well, in January, I went on a vacation in Ecuador with my wife. <clears throat> Came back, and there were no more DC-10 spots available. But would I come in for a check? Because they had just gotten a contract with the Air National Guard and Air Force Reserve flying the KC-135E model. So myself and two other medically retired pilots, Dave Johnson and Dave Nolte, with the nucleus of forming this training group for the, for the Guard and Reserves. And we trained in a simulator 16 air refueling units around the country. We fly them into the flight academy in Dallas, spend a couple of days in the simulator, fly them back to their base. But one good thing about this simulator training was that once a year we could go out to one of the units and fly a refueling mission with them. Oh, fun. And there were enough airline pilots flying with the Guard Reserve that knew that we were airline. Right. And I had about 9,000 hours, I think, in the 707, so. Oh, wow. And basically, that's what the OKC-135 is. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so they generally put us in the left seat, with an IP in the right seat. Right. We could do all this whole procedure, go out and refuel something, yeah. come back and get three takeoffs and landings. Oh, fun. That was fun. Well, that's interesting. So since, so you kept flying until what year? 
last time I flew, at PIC was probably 98, 99. Oh, wow. Wow. <clears throat> yeah, I think the last time I flew was a, a you know, aircraft commander was 87. That's when I got out of the reserve. So it seems like, I can't believe it's been so long. <laughs> it's been 32 time, years. Time goes by. Yeah, it really does. So what have you been doing since? Uh, pretty much working with the American XPOW group. I'm the adjutant or scribe there. So. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's I mean that's great. I mean you you know you you're certainly uh, got a great memory and you can tell some great stories. So. Uh, well, I think I've had a good life. Yeah, and you managed to survive the war. <laughs> and a lot of people didn't, you know. Yeah. By the way, I always ask a couple. I always, ask, where were you when the when the uh, the war in Japan ended? You were at Sebring. Sebring, Sebring Florida. How'd you find out? It was in the news. The war was over. And what happened then? Then I got out because they had a big reduction in force. Yeah, but I mean, there, what was it like? I mean, I would, I can't imagine what it had been like. I mean, I've seen pictures of people just going crazy in New York City and Hawaii, places like that. Well, it was <clears throat> pretty big for May 8th also, which is VE Day. Yeah. And VJ Day in August of right. the same year. Uh, finally over, so it was a big celebration. Yeah, but my, now I've got to get on with my life. I could could have stayed in the Air Force as a sergeant or something like that. But right. I hadn't been to college, so. So in the ensuing years after the war, so from late 45 until 47, 48, uh, I mean, a lot of people had money. People were buying cars and refrigerators and things like that. People had saved up money, I know that. I think the economy was better then, but. What would you say it would be like if you were to compare then with now? I mean, if, you ever, if you've never thought about that, I, I'm kind of curious. Not, not really. Uh, I don't think things are, I don't think you can compare 1946 or 45 at the end of the war with today's situation. Because today is so fluid, we don't know what's going to happen anymore. Uh, we're pretty sure that I think after VJ Day that we have peace in our time. Yeah. So we get on with our lives. And again, I hadn't been to college, so now's the time to continue my education. <clears throat> yeah, that seemed to be the most of it, is just get on with it. Let's go back to work. Well, one thing that we didn't cover was the during the Vietnam War. American got a contract resupply to Vietnam. So I jumped on that. And Americans started with one airplane with our contract for, with the military. And it was this Kraft Civil Reserve Air Fleet. Okay, I never, never, never That's heard where airlines will dedicate a portion of their fleet to military service okay. in case of war. Right. They had it in World War I. Okay. So I mean, CRAF, World War II. Yeah. CRAFT, yeah. okay. And, uh, so we started with 1707. I was based in New York. We did head to LA. We'd pick up the airplane and fly to Norton, pick up our load for Vietnam, and go up to Anchorage, Alaska. We'd have a layover there while the airplane went around to Circa. Yeah. Elmendorf, yeah. No, Anchorage. We went into Anchorage. Yeah, but that's the name of the base, though. It's Elmendorf, isn't it? I think El Elmendorf is. Separate from Alaska. Uh, oh, yeah, it could be a different thing. Fairbanks. Yeah. No, oh, this, was, this was an anchorage. Yeah. <clears throat> and the uh, airplane came back around. We'd fly to Japan, get another 48 hour layover while the airplane went around. And it came to us. We get out of Vietnam, offload, and back to Tokyo, get another 48 hour layover while the airplane went around the circuit. And then nonstop back to LA, and then dead head home. So, got a chance to go into Da Nang, Cameron Bay, and Saigon to offload. So, you got to go to all the spots in the war, didn't you? <laughs> well, I couldn't get over to the Mideast. <laughs> oh, my God. What's, okay, so the scariest thing that ever happened to you 
in an airplane was? Most serious. Most scariest and serious. Most scary. Probably the day I was shot down, yeah. Anything ever compared to that? No. Well, what a fantastic interview. I'm going to turn it off. And so, you know, anyway. Anything else you can think of we should talk about? No, I think we've about done it. Yeah, I think so too. <laughs> Your memory is unbelievable. Uh, that you remember all that so clearly. I, 